Nazi Germany invaded and conquered Poland in September 1939. Hitler's eventual plans for Poland required the extermination of all the Polish leaders and, of course, eventually all of Poland's Jews. As for the priests and spiritual leaders, Hitler wrote this, they will preach what we want them to preach. Oh, excuse me. There we go. Their task is to keep the Poles quiet and dull-witted. If any priest resists, we will make short work of them. Father Maximilian Kolbe of Krakow was one of the most well-known who resisted. He taught his people that believers must obey God rather than man. Father Colby was imprisoned in May of 1941 and sentenced to Auschwitz. Assigned to the timber detail, Father Colby was forced to run, carrying heavy lumber to build barracks. After months of this, a day came when Father Colby collapsed under the heavy wood. As was customary in Auschwitz, the guards converged on him, kicking and beating him with whips. They threw him in a ditch and left him for dead. But remarkably, Father Colby survived that. He continued to minister to many prisoners, praying with them, comforting them, bringing the word to them. One night, after an escape attempt, the prisoners were lined up by an empty gallows. The prisoner had not been caught, which meant death for some of those who remained. Ten of you, will die in the starvation bunker, the commandant yelled. This agonizing death often unhinged minds before it killed bodies. The commandant walked the rows of prisoners, reading numbers from filthy shirts. The chosen groaned and cried, my poor wife, one man cried, my poor children, what will they do? Suddenly there was a commotion. A prisoner had broken out of rank and was calling for the commandant, which was unheard of in itself. With his hand on his revolver, the commandant shouted, What does this Polish pig want? The other prisoners gasped. It was their beloved father, Colby. He spoke softly. I would like to die in place of one of the men you condemned. Why? the commandant snapped. I'm an old man, sir, good for nothing. My life serves no purpose. In whose place do you want to die? That one, Colby said, pointing to the man who had bemoaned his wife and children. The commandant snorted and had Colby's number written down and the other man's erased. As Father Colby passed his fellow prisoner, the astonished look had not even become gratitude though that man was grateful to Colby all of his life. The guards shoved the prisoners down into a dark windowless cell in the basement. You will dry up like flowers, sneered a guard as he shut the heavy iron door. But as the days passed, the camp became aware of something extraordinary happening in the death cells. Past prisoners had spent their time screaming, attacking one another, but now from outside the cells, they heard the sounds of singing. This time, there was a shepherd to lead the men through the valley of the shadow of death. Perhaps that's why Father Colby was the last to die. When the bunker was needed for more prisoners, the guards found four still barely alive and injected them with carbolic acid to finish them off. Father Colby sat, staring into the distance with a slight smile on his face. In a moment after the injection, he was dead. In Auschwitz today, an eternal flame burns in Colby's cell as a reminder of the love and sacrifice that he displayed amid such horrors. Father Colby saved one life by his substitution. Jesus, the Son of God, saved many. This year at Christmas, we're studying what the New Testament epistles, Paul's letters and John's, tell us about why Jesus came. Last week we saw that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. This week, in John 4, 7-14, we got a triple dose of why.
Instead of saying it once, John gives three separate but related reasons. First, the Father sent the Son to give us life. Second, the Father sent the Son to be the propitiation for our sins. And third, the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Even as we marvel at this, we cannot fail to notice in this passage that John uses those truths to reinforce his call that we love one another. Let's read the text, and we'll see why the Father sent the Son. 1 John 4, 7-14. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and anyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. The opening phrase of our text is just two Greek words, literally, beloved, love, or loved ones, let us love. In urging his readers to love each other, he first assures them that he himself loves them, the beloved, and that God loves them. Love one another, he says, for love is from God. In loving each other, we display communicate, and even model the love of God for a world that desperately needs it. God's love is the source, and we can't truly love if we're cut off from the source. John goes on to explain that everyone who does love this way is born of God and knows God. To be born of God is to be born again through faith in Jesus Christ. The verb literally means to be fathered by God, and thus to become a child of God. He fathers us through new birth in Christ, and only those who are born again by trusting in the death and resurrection of Jesus will truly know God. He says you'll know God. That's a relationship with God. The Bible never talks about knowing in terms of knowing facts or things, but in terms of this intimate knowledge, this personal knowledge, this heart knowledge that characterizes our relationship. So in God, we find a father who has given us new birth, a relationship more personal and satisfying than any earthly relationship, and who is himself a source for love, which refreshes us, empowers us, and enables us to love others. Verse 8 emphasizes the corresponding truth that someone who doesn't love doesn't know God. Since John is convinced that true biblical love only comes from God, he's equally convinced that anyone who does not display true biblical love doesn't have a relationship with God. As John Stott says, for the loveless person to profess to know God and to have been born of God is like claiming to have been born of parents whom we do not in any way resemble. It is to fail to manifest the nature of him whom we claim as our father and our friend. The nature of God that we are to manifest is love. God is love, John says. That's where this is. Right here in First John, if you wondered what that verse is, God is love right here. He is love through and through. He is love in his inmost being and essence. So when John says this, he doesn't mean that loving is one of God's many activities, but rather that all his activity is loving activity. This is the main point of a great book that came out this year. Tim Challey says, there's no doubt the consensus favorite 
Consensus favorite for books published in 2020 is Gentle and Lowly by Dane Orland. We've been reading this book in our small group. It's a tremendous book. Speaking of God's mercy or his love, for example, Orland says, Nowhere else in the Bible is God described as rich in anything. The only thing he is called rich in is mercy. And as just as God is exacting in his mercy, God is overflowing. God is love. But you might ask, how do I know that God is love? That's where Christmas comes in, verse 9. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. Jesus is the greatest demonstration of the depth of God's love. God is not content merely to be love. The Bible teaches that he ultimately acts in love. He does something to express his love. And at the very peak of that expression, God manifests, demonstrates, brings to light, reveals his love among us by sending his one and only son into the world. Notice the implications. First, God sends the Son. This is what Jesus always said, that the Father had sent him. John 6, 57. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. And this implies, by the way, that the Son was preexistent. The Son was not created by the Father. He already existed and, and was sent by the Father. John says that the Word who was in the beginning became flesh and made his dwelling place among us. Second, he is the only Son, or the one and only Son. The King James translation, only begotten, that's a bit misleading, since it implies that at some time the son was born to this father. That's not the case. In fact, usually the way this word was used was of something unique, the, the only thing of its kind. And so the book of Hebrews uses the same phrase of Isaac. He was not Abraham's only begotten son but he was the one-of-a-kind son, the unique child of the promise. In the same way, John tells us, Jesus is the Father's unique son who was sent. Why does the Father send his only son into the world? So that we might live through him. So that we might have life through him instead of death. This is, first of all, eternal life. This is spiritual life. Jesus said, whoever hears my word and believe him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. We were dead, condemned to an eternity of separation from God because of our sins. But God sent Jesus to bring us life through his death on the cross. And this life in Jesus is abundant. John 10, 10. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Abundance is what God designed from the beginning, what we now call human flourishing. God makes things the way they're supposed to be. For us, not fully yet, because Jesus hasn't come back, but substantially we have abundant flourishing life in his son. And again, this is what Christmas is all about. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live and have life through him. So that's the first of the three reasons in this passage, that we might have life. The second follows immediately in verse 10. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. The true measure of our love is not our love for God, for, for that love always falls short. We're, we're in fact not naturally inclined to love God. In, in our fallen nature, we're inclined to deny God's existence, or if we do recognize it, to create a false God that we either live in fear of or feel that somehow we've mastered. But, but to, to love God for who he is, 
We don't naturally do that. We also don't naturally love others. We're naturally selfish. But John will tell us in just a few verses, we love because he first loved us. Again, how do we know? How can we be sure of the love of God for us? We know because of Christmas. We know because of Easter. He loved us and sent his son, that's Christmas, as the propitiation for our sins. That's Easter. So, propitiation. Big, hard word that you never use in daily life. Nevertheless, translations like the English Standard Version and the New American Standard Version have kept this word in the verse because of its unique meaning. To propitiate is to give something or do something that turns aside wrath. The New International Version translates us, he lo- translated said, he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. He was the sacrifice given to atone, to pay the price, to receive the punishment, do our sins, and turn it away from us. So the point here is that God sent Jesus to die on the cross, not because we were worthy, but because we were needy. Not because we deserved life, but because we deserved death. Not because we were righteous, but because we were sinful. We were dead in our transgressions and sins, as Paul says in Ephesians. So the death of Jesus for us is the sacrifice that makes atonement. It rights the wrong that we have done toward God by sinning, and it turns aside God's wrath and punishment. So for 40 years, I have loved the footnote that is present in every edition of the New International Version Bible for this verse, because it captures clearly the meaning of the Greek word propitiate. Those of you who have the NIV will see that if we substitute the footnote wording, we get this. This then is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as the one who would turn aside his wrath, taking away our sins. That's what the incomparable love of God is all about. And so, friends, that's what Christmas is all about. The Father sent the Son, and the Son came willingly, to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. By this, Paul says in Romans, God demonstrates his love for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is the good news of Christmas, the good news we desperately need, that our community, our nation, the world around us desperately needs. Desperately needs this 2020 Christmas, desperately needs every Christmas. Christmas. It is good news of a savior from sin and a rescue from death. It is good news of an incomparable love, not frail human love, but faithful divine love, the love of God himself by which he sent his son. It's good news of a love that will sacrifice itself for others. In May 1946, in Los Alamos, New Mexico, Louis Slotin, a brilliant young scientist, performed an experiment in preparation for building the fusion bomb. He partly covered a sphere of plutonium with a half sphere of beryllium, which reflects neutrons back into the plutonium. The idea is to to cover the plutonium enough to measure the rise in neutron flux, but to leave enough of it uncovered so that the plutonium would not go critical and melt down or explode. So that day, he was holding the beryllium up with a screwdriver and starting to put in three shims. But the screwdriver slipped, and the plutonium was totally enclosed by the beryllium that that slammed down. Immediately, with a flash of blue light, the plutonium core's activity skyrocketed. skyrocketed. Slotin received a fatal dose of radiation immediately. But there were eight people in the room, and Slotin, rather than fleeing, took hold of the beryllium and lifted it off, halting the reaction and the meltdown. 
The seven others in the room survived, though one of them just barely, but Slatten died. George Vanderman writes, 20 centuries ago, the son of the living God walked directly into sin's most concentrated radiation, allowed himself to be touched by its curse, and let it take his life. But by that act, he broke the chain reaction that doomed us all. He broke the power of sin. God sent his only son into the world that we might live through him. God loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And finally, we learn that the father sent his son to be the savior of the world. This will be John's conclusion after he reminds us again how we should respond to the God, love of God that we're seeing. Verse 11, beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Twice already in this letter, John has told his leaders that his readers, that the example of Jesus' sacrifice was one that they should follow. No one who has been to the cross, who has seen God's immeasurable and unmerited love displayed there, should be able to go back to a life of selfishness. Indeed, the text implies that our love should resemble his love, having the same self-sacrificing nature. Now, you and I, of course, can't die for anyone's sins. What we can do, more and more, is to die to ourselves and to live for others. Verse 12 makes it clear that our love for one another is God's present-day witness to the world. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. Just as Jesus revealed the Father through his sacrifice, so we reveal the Father through our selfless acts of love. John Stott comments that it would be hard to exaggerate the greatness of this conception. God's love, which originates in himself and was manifested in his Son, is now made complete in his people. It is these three truths that we've seen about the love of God which John uses to entice us toward brotherly love. First, because God is love himself. Second, because God loved us and sent his son. And third, because if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in and through us. Verse 13 adds, almost parenthetically, that the Father's gift of the Holy Spirit provides assurance that we do know God. The Holy Spirit living in us is the outpouring of the loving presence of God. The Holy Spirit is how we get to know God, as the previous verse said, more and more. On top of that, the visible work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of others, especially his fruit in the lives of others, is an external witness to us of the reality of God's love. And finally, the love that we have for our brothers and sisters in Christ, a love that we recognize to be impossible in our own strength, that's evidence of the Holy Spirit creating that work within us. And then verse 14 grounds all of this in the third variation of the why of Christmas. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Again, it's Christmas in a nutshell. It's Easter in a nutshell. It's, it's the good news in a nutshell. We saw this, this saving activity last week. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, we saw in 1 Timothy. And the Father, who is love, sent his Son, who is the, in the greatest demonstration of love, to save. To save the world by, from sin by the greatest sacrifice of love and to gather to himself a people in whom his love lives. Christmas is that moment when out of pure love, the Father sent his Son, who came to be our Savior. So I want to close with one more illustration, but I want to not neglect John's other point. The Father sent his Son to be our Savior, that we might love others through his power and in imitation of him. 
So sometime earlier this year, I read a great Christmas story about the impact of our love for others, our response to the Father's love for us, and our response to the gift of his son. The story is set in 1881. It's the story of a 15-year-old boy who feels like the world has caved in because his family couldn't save enough money to buy him his first rifle for that Christmas. On Christmas Eve, they finished the chores early, and Matt figured it was because his pa wanted to make a little extra time to read the Bible. I was still feeling sorry for myself, and to be honest, I wasn't in much of a mood to read scriptures. But pa didn't get down the Bible. Instead, he bundled up and went outside. I couldn't figure it out because we had already done all the chores. Soon Pa came back in. It was a cold night out and there was new snow accumulating in his beard. Come on, Matt, he said. Bundle up good. It's cold out tonight. Now, I was really upset. Not only wasn't I not getting, was I not getting the rifle, but Pa was dragging me out in the cold. I couldn't think of anything that needed doing, especially not on a night like this. But I knew Pa was not very patient at one dragging one's feet when he told them to do something. So I got up and put my boots back on and got my cap, coat, and mittens. Ma gave me a mysterious smile as I opened the door. Something was up. Outside, I became even more dismayed. There in front of the house was the work team already hitched to the big sled. Whatever we were going to do wasn't going to be a short, easy job. We never hitched up the big sled unless we were going to haul a big load. Pa was up on the seat, reins in hand. I reluctantly climbed up beside him, the cold already biting at me. When I was on, Pa pulled the sled around the house and stopped by the woodshed. He went in and came out with an armload of wood, the wood I'd spent all summer hauling down from the mountain and then all fall sawing into blocks and splitting. Finally, I said, Pa, what are you doing? Been by the Widow Jensen's lately, he asked. Widow Jensen lived about two miles down the road. Her husband had died a year before and left her with three little children. Yeah, I said. Why? I rode by just today, Pa said. Little Jakey was out digging around on the wood pile trying to find a few chips. They're out of wood, Matt. He turned and went back into the woodshed. I followed him. We loaded the sled so high that I began to wonder if the horses would be able to pull it. Then we went to the smokehouse, and Pa took down a big ham and a side of bacon. He handed them to me and told me to put them in the sled. He went in the house and came back with a sack of flour over his shoulder and a smaller sack in one hand. What's in the little sack, I asked. Shoes. Little Jakey had gunny sacks wrapped around his feet when he was out in the wood pile this morning. I got the children a little candy, too. It just wouldn't be Christmas without a little candy. We drove to Widow Johnson's pretty much in silence. I tried to think what Pa was doing. We didn't have much by worldly standards. Of course, we did have a big wood pile. We could spare that. We also had meat and flour, so we could spare that too. But I knew we didn't have any money. So why was Pa buying them shoes and candy? We came in from the blind side of the Jensen's house and unloaded the wood as quietly as possible. Then we took the sacks and knocked at her door and opened a crack, and a timid voice said, Who is it? Luke Miles and my son Matt. Widow Jensen opened the door. She had a blanket wrapped around her shoulders. The children, wrapped in another blanket, were sitting in front of a small fire that hardly gave off any heat. We brought you a few things, ma'am, Pa said, and set down the sack of flour. I put the meat on the table. Then Pa handed her the sack that had the shoes in it. She opened it hesitantly and took the shoes out one pair at a time. There was a pair for her and one for each of the children. Sturdy shoes that would last. She bit her lower lip to keep from trembling, and then tears filled her eyes and started running down her cheeks. She looked up at Paul like she wanted to say something, but it wouldn't come out. 
We brought a load of wood, too, Pa said. Then he told me to bring in enough to last for a while. Let's get that fire up to size. Heat this place up. I wasn't the same person when I went back out to bring in the wood. Much as I hate to admit it, there were tears in my eyes. I kept seeing those three kids huddled around the fireplace and their mother standing there, tears running down her cheeks, so much gratitude in her heart she couldn't speak. My heart swelled, and a joy filled my soul like I'd never known before. I had given at Christmas many times, but never when it had made so much difference. I soon had the fire blazing, and everyone's spirits soared. The kids started giggling when Pa handed them each a piece of candy, and Widow Jensen looked on with a rare smile. She finally turned to us. God bless you, she said. I know the Lord himself has sent you. The children and I have been praying that he would send one of his angels to spare us. In spite of myself, tears welled up in my eyes again. I'd never thought of Pa that way before. But I could see that it was probably true. I was sure that a better man than Pa had never walked the earth. I started remembering all the times he had gone out of his way for Ma and me and many others. The list seemed endless as I thought about it. Tears were running down Widow Jensen's face again when we stood up to leave. Pa took each of the kids in his big arms and gave them a hug. They clung to him. They didn't want us to go. At the, ta at the door, Pa turned and said, The missus wanted me to invite you and the children to kiss Christmas dinner tomorrow. The turkey will be more than the three of us can eat, and a man can get cane tankerous if he has to eat turkey for too many meals. We'll get you about 11. It'll be nice to have some little ones around the house. Widow Johnson said, Thank you, Brother Miles. I, I don't have to say the Lord bless you, for I am certain that he will. Out on the sled, I felt a warmth that came from deep within. When we'd gone away, his pa turned to me and said, Ma, I want you to know something. Your ma and me have been tucking a little money away all year so that we could buy that rifle for you, but we didn't have quite enough. Then yesterday, a man who owed me a little money came by to make things square. We were real excited, thinking now we could get you that rifle, and I started in town this morning to do that. But on the way... I saw little Jakey scratching in the woodpile with his feet wrapped in those gunny sacks, and I knew what I had to do. So, son, I spent the money for shoes and candy for the children. I hope you understand. I understood, and my eyes became wet again. I understood very well, and I was so glad Pa had done it. Just then a rifle seemed a very low thing on my list of priorities because Pa had given me the best Christmas of my life. The Father sent the Son, gave the best gift of all that we might have life. The Father sent the Son to atone for our sins by his own sacrifice. The Father sent the Son to be our Savior. We respond at Christmas by worshiping him, sure. But more than that, our response all year long should be sacrificial acts of love for one another.